This is really our introduction to the town proper. Not only the characters, it's the first time we're actually seeing the main drag of the town. It's very early on in the film. We get right into the middle of, um, of this fight that has spilled out into the street. I'll just say that, and then we can read through it. Word is, Apaches took Doubtful Canyon and Grant Station last week, snapped some people right out of their beds. The genesis of the project was there was a comic done by Platinum Studios that caught our eye for its title. And I think in a world where studios are very frequently looking for big titles, um, there are not a lot that really stand out. And this was one that really stood out to us, but it stood out to us not just because it was a catchy title, but the promise of genre blending in a very unique way that people have never seen before. The thing that I kept wondering was, why hadn't anybody done anything like this before? The idea of cowboys and aliens coexisting in the same universe was really provocative. It causes you to react in an extreme way, and anything that causes you to react in an extreme way, I think, is ultimately pretty compelling. I've always felt like the Western could be tweaked for this sort of blending of genres. Rehearsal and action. <laughs> The cowboy logic of it is that this is between us. I think the key for movies like this, especially movies that are, are based on comic books, is to take what's real about the comic uh, and make it feel real on screen without sacrificing um, the kind of larger-than-life quality of a comic. No one's ever done anything like taking the Old West and having aliens land and invade at that time. I don't know why no one's ever done it. For me, I've been doing it in my head since I was a kid. I always loved playing a different version of Cowboys and Indians. Instead of guns, it'd be like little sci-fi guns. It becomes about doing something familiar, but make it fresh by the way you combine these things. I'm sure it's been played out millions of times in, in little kids' bedrooms with their own toys, and we brought it to the screen. A lot of people have come to believe that visitors from outer space had something to do with the building of the pyramids. And so it just seemed that if ancient Egyptians had had an interaction, why couldn't pioneers of the West? I'm sure this could have happened, and it would have been wild. <clears throat> Where's our gold tank? <clears throat> our movie hit the West with all of its tension. In the West, people looked at each other sideways, and there was racism, and there was hardship. The best Westerns acknowledge, you know, all of it. Deceit and crime, you know, all, all of those frontier aspects that really existed and created a lot of drama and a lot of tension. You know, all of these people, whether it's the Cowboys, the Apaches, the Chiricahua, in the Old West, if you look at that situation, it was a very uncomfortable time to live. It certainly wasn't safe or easy. Well, I'm gonna need you to come with us. There's this great palette of characters to draw from and imagery, but it's made a little bit fresher by the fact that you are now creating an effect show around the backdrop of a Western. When you hear a title like Cowboys and Aliens, you may think something very pulpy, and there is a certain fun and, and pulp associated with it, but when you see uh, the tone that John Favreau brings to it, you see that you can really imagine it happening. I think the thing that I really respect that you know, Alex and Bob and the writers and John Favreau did with this concept and was keeping it authentic. And they can get all real from the standpoint of the characters. When you look away from him or you look away from each other in that last beat, it makes you have to sort of start again. So I'd love for like the last line he says, I don't want to do that again to make right. you both look okay. at each other, kind of laugh, and let the laugh turn into a right. still moment and turn into. Got it. It was so important for all of the filmmakers that we wanted to make, first and foremost, a good Western. What's happened to the Western is it, it's gotten absorbed into other genres. You know, if you think about Star Wars, what they did in a very clever way was borrow the iconography of the West and then update it with science fiction. It was the opportunity to take advantage of the humanity of the Western and then to fold into it a sense of contemporary interests. It's sort of a genius concept. They're coming back! If the aliens never came down in this story, there's a tremendous story of conflicted characters and a kind of range war that starts to bubble up to the surface at the very first act. I need that weapon. It's the only thing that counts. 
it's cool to see characters who would have been shooting at one another a few days before are suddenly forced to try to survive together. As a movie, it makes perfect sense. It's a very imaginative, but somehow emotionally relatable story. These are real people in this real situation. And it, the more you feel like you're part of this world, the more exciting and interesting it becomes when everything gets turned on its ear. Here we have an opportunity in Cowboys and Aliens to take what is mythically very satisfying and then update all of it by using all the cutting edge technology and that's the fun part for me. Let me talk about how lucky I feel to be able to be doing a Western, to be able to be working in this beautiful state where I'm, I'm falling in love with this city just from living here for the last couple weeks and the both in front of and behind the camera I've never felt better about the people I've worked with so I just want to thank everybody ahead of time this is really a blessing and I feel tremendously well supported by everybody so I might not have a moment to do it because I'm going to be in the whirlwind of this movie but you have my deep gratitude and thanks and appreciation so thank you and I can't tell you how forward I am looking to what we're about to start on tonight John Favreau is just quickly proving to be this filmmaker who has incredible range. He's somebody that knows how to make audience-pleasing movies, but on the sort of highest level. John really is more like those old-fashioned directors that came out of old Hollywood that understood theater, understood drama, understood comedy, and could combine them in very eclectic ways. So every time he makes a movie, you have to say, wait a second, is that the same John Favreau who directed from that, that one? And then is that the same guy that directed this one? He's incredibly smart, but as bright as he is, he's not looking down his nose at anything. If it entertains, if it rocks, if it's cool, if it comes from some place of humanity and emotion, which he sort of builds from, you know, then he's into it. So this is day one, night one, really. We've been rehearsing in here for a few days. Um, I'm as know as much as I could. I'm more prepared than I've ever been on anything. But this is one of those movies where is, there's so much continuity, so many characters. It's a real ensemble. Everything has to unfold a certain way. He's got such a talent for for this kind of movie. When I spoke to him about it, he just he'd fallen in love with the idea. He wanted always wanted to make a, a western and, and the mashup of this. He I think it just sort of played straight into his strengths. There's something intuitive that tells you, yeah, I guess I am that guy. I did take those people out. I do have these types of reflexes. I killed a woman. Well, you really did kill a woman. And so that's the one that I, I think those we gears need to, we need to see it hit. We need to see it hit. I remember the meeting when I went in and said, this is the coolest script ever. This is amazing. And I can't think of better people to make this film than John Favreau, who is so good at communicating with actors, at making a great story, but particularly at elevating the genre, elevating the adventure film or the, you know, popcorn movie into something really great. John Favreau is perfect for these kinds of movies because he finds a tone and a reality that highlights the characters and not the gimmicks and lets the fun and the story come out of real situations and real characters and, and things that are a little, uh, not always right down the middle, that are a little unexpected. I think it's about week three, I'm not sure. We're on night so I lose track of time. Uh, the wind's kicked up here. We had to pull all the condors down, all those cool lighting rigs that run off cranes. So we were, we were going to really hit it hard today. We got the kid only for two hours a night uh, because we're working nights. And he's got to be out of here because the New Mexico rules fairly early. And uh, as you can see behind me, the wind's pretty nasty. So we had to pull all the condors down. When you're doing uh, a sci-fi movie or a Western, there, there's an incredible spectrum of variance and tone to both genres. So you really need to be able to know exactly where this movie falls between those two genres in order for it to be successful. And John truly is a master of tone that way. He really does understand, I think, instinctively what crosses a line for audience into campy and how far they will allow themselves to be stretched in, in, in believability. Um, and I think that's something that you can't really learn. I think it's something that you're born with on instinct. John's amazing with that. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but you gotta keep shooting. You gotta press on. Everything's looking good so far. Saw so some cutscenes today, look great. Uh, dailies from, from all the explosions look great. So creatively my spirits are high, but you know, there's always a curveball coming your way. And uh, 
and this is one of them, but we'll, we'll get through it. Being an actor himself, he speaks the actor's language, and so he's so good at communicating ideas and concepts to all of us. But he's also a great communicator to his crew, and so there's a wonderful feeling on set, a feeling of, of, of common understanding. I think as an actor, he was uh, very sensitive and specific. So he has a sense of story, I think, that, uh, that serves him very well. And he understands how each element is really a building block for the story overall. That if you indulge in you know, a, a detail and forget a, the big picture, uh, you're building in an obstacle that's hard to overcome. Here we are, we're second to last week of shooting. We're here on our, our cavern set. Uh, we shot a lot of the practical work in there with, uh, with Jake running around. The riverboat, which we were in a few weeks ago, we, we used a lot of the puppets. Here we're going to be doing a lot of CGI. We're definitely a sci-fi movie now. We were Western for a long time, and this is the part of the movie where we're firmly entrenched in, in, in the science fiction genre. And it's fun. I'll be happy when we're done, though. I thought we're getting tired. Well, I just think that what grounds John is he comes at everything based on behavioral approaches. You know, uh, how would these characters behave? How can I make this more authentic? And the more the genre imposes the limitations on the filmmaker, John certainly is able to take those limitations and turn them into tremendous advantages based on his complete knowledge of acting and directing actors and, and, and writing. It's a wonderful combination. So this is um, the last day of photography in Los Angeles. I'm actually looking to rolling up my sleeves and getting into the effects work and then ultimately seeing how the whole movie hangs together. Hopefully it, it all works out. He's one of the nicest people in the world to work with. Like, I really admire him because it's, um, he pulls together a great team of people, um, all who have the same passion he does. He's fun. You see many directors that just suffer through the shooting of a film, can't wait to get alone in, in the editing room and think that that's where the movie happens. And sometimes it does, but in this kind of film, I think it was very important to get it on the day, in the location. And I think he managed what could have been a very difficult process really well. Get that on, yeah, good, that's good behind the scenes. If it's half as exciting at home as it is now, he never freaks out, never worries too much, has great faith that it will all work out in the end. And so everyone is very relaxed. And I think on a film set, what you need is communication and trust. And that is what he's been able to establish on this set. And so I've heard on all of his sets, and I think that's why everybody from actors to key grips to prop masters, everybody likes working with John. Very sensitive to the emotional relationships between characters. He's very sensitive to performance, but not indulgent about it. He's collaborative with the actors, also with the rest of his crew, with his art director and, and uh, his cinematographer. So there's a, there's a kind of generosity that proceeds from John that is really uh, great to be around. As, as good of a time as I've had out here, I'm really happy to go home. It's, uh, it's gonna be a tremendous relief to be home in my own bed. And it feels like I've been on an adventure, and I tell you, it, it, most people who are my age, they, they're in the comfortable part of their lives, you know? They're in routines. And what's fun about the film business is it forces you out of that box. You have to meet new people, go new places, do new things, and it's exciting. It's exhausting, but it's really exciting, and it makes me really um, grateful for what I get to do for a living. On a movie like this, which, you know, has a great deal of effects in it, um, which can be very laborious because you're sort of trying to sort of figure things out where the aliens are going to be. They're coming in from over here. You're going to be over there. And it can be quite laborious because you're trying to figure out things very technically. He keeps the mood on the set incredibly light and therefore very creative all the time. And it was just a sort of complete pleasure working with him. And that way we can take care of these injuries. That's me. 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 I think the strongest part of, of any film is how you cast it up. And if you have the right people, that's when everything falls into place. And I think anchoring this film, we have a tremendous cast that could work in both the classic Western form and also all the excitement that would be associated with an alien invasion movie. 
the town of Absolution is this hard scrabble town, and so you find the kind of characters that you would expect to see there. I think the casting of this film is amazing. I can't imagine anybody else in any of these roles. The group of actors that they have, you want to be a part of that. As an actor, you, you want to work with, with these people. Keith Carradine plays Sheriff Taggart. Sheriff Taggart, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the law, and, and in this case, Harrison Ford is the hard place because he's a powerful guy. Keith, he knows the Western genre so well. And you know that if he's in a Western, it's good because he has such good taste in them that he would never do one that wasn't good, you know? <laughs> but Keith is just really of of that world. He just belongs in 1875. He just makes sense there. I'm very comfortable with the Western. Yeah, this is, I've been doing this. This is my, my first movie was a Western, which I shot a mile from here. Damn it, Percy. You crossed the line this time. I gotta lock you up. Dagger. You know that's not a good idea. Adam Beach, so good at what he does, really broke my heart in this movie. His character is such a hero. I feel honored because, you know, I've never played a cowboy before. I'm always the Indian. It's pretty nice to sit back and get it from this perspective. Working with these actors, it's been educational, but also a process where if you listen and just respond, it's that much easier to connect. Nat, Nat, you son of a bitch, where are you going? Don't worry. I'll tell your father about what happened. Paul Dano plays my son, who is the kind of schoolyard bully that nobody has any respect for, but has to deal with. You know, he's a wonderful actor, very unique character. I love him from the first moment he's on screen. He's interesting, and Paul is such a fantastic actor that he brought something really kind of creepy, but also hilarious to that character. It's nice because it, it's an ensemble. Watching a lot of old westerns, there's so many great parts in those old westerns, and there's so many great character actors in those old westerns. And so I feel like every Everybody kind of has an opportunity to, to bring something to the table. Hey, 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 hey! What are you doing? What are you doing? Percy, there's people up there! There's no one out there, it's fine! It's not fine! Sam Rockwell has one of my favorite roles in the movie. Doc is really, I think, the audience's eye. He's really kind of scared when it should be scary. You know, he's not too much of a hero. He's really an everyman who makes this incredible transformation. Doc serves as the comic relief and a little bit of the moral conscience. What I was really watching was a lot of Jimmy Stewart. Mainly the, the character in Man Who Shot Liberty Valance was the, was the character that I was clinging to. As an actor, he's always asking questions and he's really interested in every single scene and always looking for something else. He's such a good actor that I'm, I'm just happy to be with this cast. Everyone is amazing. That's my fault she got took. I never should have taken her to that town. No, 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 not your fault. You'll get her back. You're setting things right. Just gotta have faith, that's all. We're interacting with characters at a very human level, you know. Even though I'm the preacher, it's very much the humanist message of the of, of the film. You know, you just gotta get up in the morning. It doesn't matter what happened. You gotta get up the next day and you gotta take care of business. I don't know that Meacham's a very successful spiritual leader, but he's just, you know, just trying to make sense of it himself. We wanted the audience to be sucked into this the idea that they were watching a good Western. Otherwise, it would have felt like we were in a sort of non-existent world. This was a real time, this, these were real people, and something awful happened to them. And hopefully that way, then the, you, can sort of, you can stay emotionally tied to the movie. You have this great palette of characters to draw from and imagery, but it's also updated and made a little bit fresher and more compelling by the fact that you are now creating an effect show around the sleepy backdrop of a western town. We knew that New Mexico was the place that we wanted to shoot because of the open terrain, the vast areas of private property where we could find untouched land without telephone poles, thus the period 1870s. Absolution was a location on private property, a big ranch that had been there for a long time, about half an hour outside of Santa Fe. And it was one of three existing Old West towns that are out there nearby. And this one that we chose to use, it was built in the mid 80s. It was created for an Italian spaghetti western, a B movie with a leading actor who was rather short. So what they wound up doing was building this intersection of a town to scale to him, except for one building, which was the saloon. It was a two-story structure, so that had to be to real scale. All of our hero areas we redid, if not from scratch, 
nearly from scratch. And then all the other buildings that were in the outlying areas, it was additions. We basically bumped up the scale of windows, of the top parts of the buildings, and the, all the crowns and all that stuff. It, it all got substantially bigger. And in that way, we didn't have to tear down the whole town and start from scratch. It's all the, the tricks of making things larger, adding things here, subtracting things there, that is just classic design work on location. It turned into a really satisfying experience, making that midget town full scale. To be able to be here on this location and, and, and set this up in a practical way and see these vistas off in the distance, you just you can't replace that. Mexico is such a, a stunning place and you know the light was amazing we couldn't have made the movie unless we'd gone there it's easier when it's more real that's why we try to actually shoot on location and try to build it as authentic as possible I love being outside and uh, I like an outside job much more fun than being on a sound stage we shot in beautiful places and it was a lot of fun just to be there with the costume designer, we are, are, of course, instantly sharing what our approaches are, what our feelings of the color and authenticity and historical accuracy and all of that stuff. And Mary had actually just come off of True Grit, so she had a huge foundation of research already done. You do your research and then you know everything. And by learning about it and researching, it helps inform your design because there are certain technical things that you need to know. It was a combination of being true to the time period, being true to the story, and also being flattering and like serving the story. Story. Like that's to me is my most the most important part of my job is how do the costumes serve the story. The more authentic it is, the easier the acting is. This is the kind of material they wore. This is the kind of feeling they had. It's probably why because I'm all dressed in wool that you know that laconic <laughs> character comes out because you just you just can't move real fast. Aside from getting the cut in an accurate fashion and using the right kind of fabric, the aging is hugely important on a western because it doesn't look good unless you age it right. She is all about details. You know, she just takes the fabrics and sometimes like painted it or makes the graphics. I don't know, she does so much work behind every single custom. The color palette of the movie, it felt like it should be a faded dusty sort of a desaturation of color. So there are greens in the movie, but they're really desaturated. There's a lot of browns because for men's clothing, men's clothing was available in gray, black, and brown. That's pretty much it. And all of the clothing was made out of wool, except for their shirts. They didn't have cotton vaqueros, even though it was in Mexico, they made them out of wool. And the women were wearing cotton, but they had undergarments. Like they had to have a corset on, and we made all the background wear corsets because it helped them have the right kind of posture, but also gave them the right silhouette because in those days it was all about having a small waist. I'm a stickler for details like that. We're in New Mexico, it's hot. We're in a desert, I'm wearing chaps. I'm wearing a gun around my waist. I've got cowboy boots on and a hat. The cowboy kind of just comes. Those Westerns that we grew up with or know about were very much stories told in a specific place. And you got a sense of the scale of that place. The sheer power of nature is, comes through nature and the landscape that you're in and the opportunity to bring modern kind of filmmaking devices to the Western. It, it makes sense. We wanted to take something that was familiar and explore the immersive experience of really feeling in, in modernizing all of that. You are in the Old West. And so instead of it being the sepia-toned photograph in a distance, you find yourself in the middle of it all. First time I talked to you, we were on the phone. I know I met you when we were traveling. And then I was in Canada, that's right, I was in Toronto. That's right, we had a long chat on the phone. And right. we, we immediately got to the point, which is how that you wanted to make this movie. Yes. And how that, in spite of what it was called and how, you know, what the preconceptions would be, you wanted to make sure that we were gonna make a cowboy movie. Right. I had, genuinely, my thoughts were, this is fantastic. I really, really was impressed by it. I really thought it was kind of a, a great group of people to get together and make a movie. And I just phoned my agent up and said, this is amazing, great, I think it's Good. very funny. I'd love to see this movie. But I, to play a cowboy. But guy, no, no, right? but I'd love to see it. I wouldn't love to, I, 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 I couldn't be in it, but I'd love to go mm -hmm. and watch it. I'll be the first in line when mm -hmm. this comes out. And it was sort of, it was, 
just talk to John, get to see. And I was like, okay, I, I'm, yeah. I find it. And as soon as I had the conversation with you, I was just like, okay, no, look, this is something I can get my head around. Mm -hmm. um, and Stephen, and feel had, confident said, about Stephen that. had said great things about you and working oh. with you. And a lot of it's discussing, is this guy a cowboy? Mm. They asked me, uh, how, how did you feel about it? You took an American role and put a, a, mm. uh, somebody who's the most British mm. character. And I said, I didn't see it that way. I really mm. saw, you know, you needed somebody who looked like they were, they had lived a life mm. that they were seeking. They were not coming of age, they were seeking salvation and redemption. So mm. it had to look like you had lived a full life. Old enough and weathered enough is basically what you're looking for. <laughs> okay, but, sophisticated, I, no. but also mature in choices, you yeah. know what I mean? And, and uh, uh, other people yeah. uh, our age have a different energy about them. You yeah. know, it's, it depends on how you grew up and, yeah. and what type of depth you bring. And so you felt like a grown up. Mm. and not like a kid coming mm. out. And, mm. and I love when I could see a, a person think, and they're not yeah. busy with their choices, but yeah. clearly there's an inner monologue going yeah. on. Yeah. I'm just counting, you know that. Is there really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doing some. <laughs> but you bring a certain irony to it, a little mm. bit of fun, but it always feels like uh, you never know what's going to happen next. And there's a, a sense of spontaneity and, and uh, an urgency to everything. And, and uh, I just think it's, it's that thing, isn't it? it I, I've always been a fan of movies like this and big movies and you know, like your movies and things. Um, if there's a believability in it, then yeah. anything can happen. And you're, you have the space to sort of work around that. And it's, that's what these movies are about. They're about getting an audience to emotionally engage and then sort of like wow them with something, you know, with something uh, incredible. What changed with uh, with the way you're perceived back home after after Casino Royale came out? Now, are you yeah. big there? You, you, clearly, you're from there. No, just it was a Bond nobody thing. Nobody knows. Are who you I like am that? Of course they do. But you like? No it? idea. James Bond never went down <laughs> back in England. <laughs> they have a lot to say about James Bond. They they they, 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 they do. I don't, you know. I mean, he's been theirs be longer than he's been yours. It has. How has like that changed? Like fifty years longer, I think. Yes, it's like, yeah. it was before you were born. Even, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. How has that changed from when you were cast to when? When it's you, uh, it's like on the whole, now. it's really good. I mean, thankfully the movie came out well, so people like uh, like it. And because um, they were busting you, uh, busting your chops about it. Before I got it came nailed. Out. I did a press conference um, that I got the job. I was filming in Baltimore, and um, they said we're going to launch it. We're going to do this, and I was hear hearing this thing. They were going to stick me in a Harrier jump jet and <laughs> fly me down the Thames, and it was like going, okay, what? I was just like, sure. okay, I'm in your hands, whatever. And instead, what they did, they got the, the Royal Marines to drive me down the uh, Thames on, a, on these attack boats, which are spectacular, uh -huh. but they wouldn't let me on them without this um, life jacket. Uh -huh. So immediately, that was the first thing the press hit upon him. Oh, what a pansy. He, <laughs> He's has wearing to wear a life jacket. Yes. You should have been in a tuxedo. Uh, probably, what, right. Probably. Right. Instead, you're in probably, that. Probably, yeah. I yeah. always had this long hair because I was doing <laughs> this job, which was. He had kinda, long hair. Which was kind of like water weird. Wings. It was all wrong. Weird water wings <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> just, they were just like, they were oh, holding, no, a martini. Just holding a martini. <laughs> so then I got nailed by them. Right. It yeah. was James Bland and kind of shit right, like that. Right, right. Okay, so uh, how long did you have to wait until the, that was before oh, you Oh, it got filmed. worse. It got a lot worse. Because <laughs> that was the press. Right. When it hit the internet, right. then it just doubled in size. Of course. And Is that when you learned don't look at the internet? That was when I learned don't look at it. I hadn't been looking at the internet, and that's when I learned not to, and then you sort of, you know, then it becomes like crack. Um, <laughs> No, I was in the Bahamas and I just got a call from one of my people who just said, you know, things are it's looking and not so good. And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? It's all going great. We're making a great movie. It's all good. And it's like, well, yes, it's just the public opinion. It's not in oh, your favor. Oh, you were filming. Oh, yeah, we're right in the middle of filming. Of course, I went straight to the internet and went, oh, my God, and sort of typed in my name. And then you spend the next five hours, like, going down to some blog that's happened and, you know, yeah. where someone's just spitting that you know, I'm, I'm doing this role. And... And then I switched the computer off and I went, well, what can I do about it? It's too late. It's nothing I can do about it. I'm doing it now. Just make the best movie Just you can. Just make the movie we, best movie we can. So, so Bond comes out and then all of a sudden you went from the guy they were making fun of to the guy that they're now embracing as a national yeah, hero. Yeah, I mean, we had a premiere in London, and it was, that, which is always bizarre. It was a royal premiere. You know, I kind of got, got to meet the Queen. And, wow. And uh, the moment when the kind of lights went down and they, uh, the, there was a, an applause when the music started, and at the end of the, the um, title sequence, I kind of come, and my face is just on the screen in the movie opens, and the audience just screamed and cheered, and I went, oh my God, fucking hell, I mean, what's that about? I really yeah, didn't, I was just, I genuinely yeah, was like, yeah. I had no conception of how this film would work. Sure. Um, and kind of from that point on, the, just the way the audience reacted and were hungry for it and hungry for the kind of, mm -hmm. and it just, I kind of knew, uh, you know, I kind of went, okay, maybe this will be okay. We were very fortunate, Cowboys and Aliens, to have 
a really solid document by the time you, you mm, saw a draft mm, of it. Mm. And I had worked with the writers, but mm. to have writers that were also producers mm. and were on the set and mm. had authority mm. yeah. with Bob Orsi on yeah, the yeah. set and when yeah, Alex yeah. was around as yeah. well, to have people that could turn pages around if we've had a discussion, especially yeah. you, me, and Harrison, sometimes yeah. like, yeah. let's talk about yeah. this doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. in light of what we've shot. Yeah. So let's talk through the logic yeah. of this. Yeah. And let's talk through the cowboy logic and let's talk through the yeah. sci-fi logic. Yeah, yeah, which is why we, it was fantastic having Harrison around. Yeah. He, and he, because he, he's got cowboy logic. <laughs> he does. Mm, yeah. And that was really what was um, the most inspiring thing is that yeah. he, he really, if there's anybody who's proven himself, yeah. And could slow down yeah, when we, you get when you're as old yeah. as he is, you know, <laughs> and still have that. <laughs> it's true, but he's in great shape, you know. Yeah, know. And, and he, you know. know, the flying, and, know. and then with the movie, he's I like know. just as intense about I the know. movie. He's know, like, how are we going to solve this? What are we going to do yeah. here? It was never like the uh, thing because I was sort of, sort of like about. this sort of legend that he, you know, you couldn't stop him doing stunts, and you can't. It's true. All he wants to do is get blown up. Yeah, <laughs> and, and on the horse, and, and, and with the horses running by him, and yeah. get that get that explosion closer. Yeah. And we make it bigger. Yeah. I can't hear the damn thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there he was. Yeah. And, and so when he had a suggestion about an action sequence, I knew mm. yeah. it wasn't just an actor who wanted a yeah. better line. It yeah. was somebody who wanted the whole movie to work. Yeah. We, luck, we lucked out, really, didn't we, in that sense, because he could have, he could, it could have gone the other way completely. Well, a lot of it was you, too. A lot of it was you really making room for him and making him feel uh, like... I mean, I mean, there's all the sort of gaps that I could see for myself and, you know, just sort of... He filled in. And there's, you know, there, there was a relationship there that we talked about. I remember we talked about it early on, about the relationship between Dollarhide and, um, and Jake, and that potentially there was a good thing, but it was always going to rely on who we cast, and it was impossible to sort of... You know, until we got that person in the room, how that would go, and either it would work or it would sort of be something we'd kind of go. You know, we'd have to rethink. Remember when I, I said that there might be a chance that, yeah. that Harrison, yeah, yeah, I know, I might know. come on board. I don't know what expletive I used, but it was a positive one. I know that. I mean, I, it just made perfect sense, and I think I don't. I, I think I don't know if we even sort of played around with the idea in a conversation. No, it I wasn't even a possibility. Yeah. I felt like we were two little boys uh, getting yeah. ready to play a game, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Which is what, it's always nice to feel like that. Isn't it? Yeah. I have to say, with this film, it was, it, I really felt that way more than any that I've ever been on. I had the most fun on this movie that I've had for okay. many years, yeah. many, many yeah. years. And I, something happened that happened, I think, very quickly in the rehearsal process when we got together and that continued in the shooting process. And it wasn't, it was a genuine sort of, Maybe there's a kind of weighing up that happens. You go into a rehearsal room, you've got Harrison Ford there, Olivia's there, and you know, people mm -hmm. are kind of a little bit kind of, well, how's this going to play out? And everybody, as soon as they realize that no one was trying to screw anybody, yeah. that everybody was just trying to do a good job and just do all that, everybody relaxed. Mm -hmm. And that made it possible for when we're in Santa Fe and kind of whatever, doing six day weeks and 14 hour sure. days, to sort of say, anybody fancy a drink tonight? And everybody went, yeah, we do it. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't socialized on a movie for 10 years. met Spielberg on? Well, it was, it was post Road to Perdition, so I'd kind of met him briefly on a red carpet. Um, I see. And, uh, and that was a DreamWorks film? That was a DreamWorks film. That Sam Mendes, is that where you Sam met Mendes. Sam Mendes? That's where too? I met Sam, yeah. And yeah. now he'll be working with you on, on, the, Bond. on the Bond film? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's uh, classing up a it's, franchise, isn't it? Well, I, I, well I, I don't, I mean, what, I think it's a kind of great choice because I think Sam has what he has is a sort of fervor and and energy to really direct a Bond movie with a capital B. I, sure. I mean, I mean, he's just completely feet first thrown himself into it and and, and read every every book and just soaked up everything about it. And yeah. I mean, I read the script the other day, and I'm I'm more excited about this than I was about Casino, because we've kind of got a classic Bond movie plus lots of other things. But. So classic. Uh, so because um, the one thing I. Look, I love everything you guys have done. Mm. I miss, I miss the inventions. I miss, I miss the whole Q it's side a really, of things. It's a really difficult thing. I mean, we, I, is that I, from I, the books? Is the whole Q uh, thing with the inventions? The Q, the Q is thing. That, is that well, from the movies? He's, uh, he's called the quartermaster, so he's Q. That's why he's called. So he's, yeah. he's basically the guy who go and get the guns off. Sure. But then the whole thing sort of became something else. And as a the kid, books. I loved yeah. all of that. But stuff. the problem we yeah. have with that, and this is why we get keep going when we get. We sit down and have meetings about it. Is that you know? There's a magazine called Gadget. There's a magazine mm -hmm. called you know, mm -hmm. and you go through it and it's full of gadgets. It's sure. full of stuff. And actually trying to find something that's new and interesting yes. is really difficult unless you're sort of approaching sort of like you know highly secret you know sort of yeah. top secret sort of yeah. Ministry of Defense is using. But mostly you know, 
the technology is in the public arena now, so, or some type of it. It's I mean, true, and it is a very yeah. tonally different. And mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, because you guys went so uh, realistic with Bond when mm -hmm. we were working on Iron Man, mm -hmm. a big discussion we had is, look, mm -hmm. there's this there's this kind of tongue-in-cheek fun, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, man in mm -hmm. the tuxedo gallivanting yeah, yeah, around, yeah. saying, a, yeah. uh, throwing a one-liner out yeah, there, yeah. and then yeah, yeah. fighting crime. Yeah. We could, that's kind of been left Nobody's servicing that yeah, moment. Yeah. No, no, sure. And I think some of that might have been through, um, you know, Austin Powers. Well, that, that I mean, that's I mean, that's the truth of it is. I mean, I, we I literally kind of I, I had a bell on set, which was we can't go down this road. It's too yeah. Austin Powers, and, and it's all. I mean, it's like the postmodernist thing of you yes. know, the joke's been kind of it's it's been killed. It's yes. been killed yes. because now you can't wink at it because he's he's double winked at it. It's so it's it's like yeah. the bird that yeah. flies in smaller and smaller yeah. circles till it flies up its own ass. But it, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> and we it's found. Like, that. I just want to let that image just settle into my head. Well, that's what's happening with superhero <laughs> yeah. movies. Yeah. Yeah. We were like, as yeah. when we're doing Iron yeah. Man, we're like, this is Team America. We yeah. can't do this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is great Moment. because there's great there's, that there's comedy like that around yeah. because it really does it elevates things. But you have to think that much harder. It's so the comedy is so smart yeah. and so. Uh, well observed mm. that you can't get away with just going mm. through the motions of it. So you have to, and I think what was smart about the Bond franchise mm. is whatever that partnership of producer, director, yourself, mm. uh, writers that came up with it, mm. the intensity of the action, mm. but yet there's still a, a, a little bit of a swagger to it. Mm. But it's so dry and so mm. subtle that mm. you can't really pin it on it. It doesn't mm. feel like it's commenting on mm. itself. It just is kind of in the DNA. There's a fun to it. Trailer yeah. is a uh, well, the dragon good. tattoo. Trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. it's like I yeah, love that good. it's not trying to. It's different. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's not trying to apologize. And Absolutely, and I can't be. I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, I can't sing Sony's praises enough, really, mm -hmm. because they're actually the, the fact that they've actually. I mean, look, it's a it's a worldwide bestseller, but it's still a big risk. And sure. you, you know, making a movie like this that uh, for this much money and not making it a PG thirteen. Well, it, you couldn't have made the movie. There's a bit pointless making the movie because the movies, the, the books are so you know graphic. It's not really the word, but they're, they're you know they're, they're they're adult. That's it. Yeah. But they've done it and they're prepared to put this out as an R. And you know they're, they're, they seem to be embracing yeah. it for the marketing. Yeah. And why not? Yeah. What, different, just, very different from how he's portrayed in the book. Your character, Michael uh, Blanc. Yeah, I think so. Well, especially because also I was coming off Cowboys. I was the fittest I think I've ever been in my life. Uh -huh. And he was like, just literally sending me bowls of pasta to the room. Going, You've got to look like a journalist. <laughs> How'd you navigate the accent? That was the one thing I kept saying. I, I didn't. Re I really s I didn't go for it. I mean, I, yeah. and it was. I had a long discussion with David about. It. I said, you see, I don't, he said, I don't want you to do anything that's going to sort of get in the way. And I said, look, I know so many Swedish people or Scandinavian people who have cut glass English accents. They learn. Right. You know, they listen to the BBC all the time. So I gave it a hint. I tried to get the names right. And, yes, right. And so it wasn't the uh, Swedish chef from the Muppets. Sweden. I tried that one. He didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think it, I think it works. I think it works. It's yeah. great. And and yeah. you got you know what's also cool is that you mm. you know here you were uh, James Bond. Mm. You know first becoming that. Mm. The challenge of that is mm. how do you not end up being mm. just that for the rest of your career? You know the thing and is I I had actually kind of come to terms with that when I accepted the part I kind of went if that happens that happens but now look you're doing yeah. roles that are each yeah. are iconic roles in a different yeah. way well, you know if, if, if Cowboys and Aliens is successful that mm. that could be a, uh, certainly mm. a, a different defines you differently mm. Mm. and then certainly mm. uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo has mm. a you know that's a that's a franchise. If that's mm. successful, there's a whole series of books oh, to draw from. What's nice is you've balanced things out. I think mm. it was, you know, it was very patient. There was no done. plan there. I mean, there wasn't. No, Christ, no. Yeah. It just happened. What happened? You know. I mean, I, I, I genuinely. I mean, the fact of it is, I, you know, I got to do a cowboy movie this year, which was probably the only boyhood acting dream I ever had. When I woke up one morning uh, before we started and opened the newspaper to an article on, uh, in which all seven producers had been uh, interviewed yes. about the part they played in picking my hat. There was a lot. There was a lot of discussion about the hat. None of it in front of me. Oh, sure there was. You were very particular about the hat. Well, I was very particular about it. Because I remember there was a lot of discussion, I, and Stephen did have a lot to say about the hat. Well, they had a lot to say, but, but it was Mary's Offerys yes. and, and, and I that, that picked the hat. Yes. And, and creased the hat and submitted uh, the hat, for, hat approval. for approval. But there was a lot of Indiana Jones looming. Well, the last thing I wanted was for it to look like Indiana Jones's yeah. hat. And, and with Stephen Pretty also, I obvious. think Stephen also, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was that deal. When, when I first read the script, the guy had a whip. That's right. Right. And I said, well, that we didn't you know, put the that whip was in, that's pretty obvious, too. No, no whip. No whip no and a different hat. 
Yeah. You don't need seven producers <laughs> to tell you that. <laughs> right. But costume is character. Yes. You know. And the gun. It took a while to pick the gun. Yeah, but and that's character. And how it was that's carved character. And that's character. For you especially. Well, You're very focused on that. Those details uh, are, are very specific to Well, it character. makes my work easier. If you can see it, I don't have to talk about it. I don't have to create, uh, uh, you know, uh, behavior which tells you what you can see. How yeah. was Mary to, to, Mary to work with? Mary was great. She was great. She had just come Mary, off a of True Grit. She had, so she had She knew of, the time, she the had, era. She had great uh, experience with the Western and the wisdom to know that this was not the same kind of movie. Yes. She didn't violate, though, the period. She no, really she was careful about the, the materials. But she, but she, the hats changed a lot after that period to well, a more traditional you're, cowboy You're the hat. guy. Here's the one hat discussion that I had. You showed me a hat, an illustration of a hat. And it looked like the hat of a miner who had been sleeping uh, out behind the restaurant. Well, that was my backstory for you. Yeah. Well, it didn't work. Let me tell you, Mary, this Mary Zoffries yeah. drew it. So well, anyway, she's not, she came she's not shitting gum understanding drops. that... that 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 uh, that uh, uh, that was not the hat for the miner and the sleeping no, behind not, the not the right behind Denny's not the right. I remember hat. you picked the largest hat that we had. Well, I did. I mean, and the biggest horse and and the yes, fastest the, horse. Yes, that's right. And the longest gun. But and chaps. You want the chaps too in the beginning, if you recall. Until I saw Daniels, <laughs> and then I thought. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that could be yours. You I know, think both of you and Chaps would have been good. Uh, it's a, it's another movie, and we can make that one. <laughs> we can make that one. And the advantage is that we won't have to leave home. We can just do it in town. It'll be great. So I was just remembering our first our first meeting was you'd come by my office. Yeah. You'd read the script, and yeah. we had looked, and we were looking at the artwork. Yeah. I remember Bob Orsi was there too, yes. our producer and one yeah. of the writers. How did you feel when he said that when he and his writing partner had gotten their first check, the first thing they bought was a life-size sculpture of you in carbonite, and they and it's in their conference room now? Was that, did you? That did worried you, me a little. Did it a little bit? <laughs> that worried me a little. Yeah. Yeah. And everything seemed to be going very well. Did, what was your impression of this project when you first uh, heard about Cowboys and Aliens? Well, I read 30 pages. Is that and, all? And then I threw it across the room, and <laughs> okay. I called my agent, and I said, I don't get it. I mean, there's nothing in this for me. Why, why are you asking me to do this? Yes. And he said, have a little faith. This is the way of the world now. You're an older person. Maybe you don't understand how things work. This is a ringing endorsement. Read, read the yeah. rest of the script. Okay. I read the rest of the script. And I said, I don't get it. There's, <laughs> there's nothing in this for me. And, and then I said, you know, why don't I go see this guy? So I went to see you. And, but so when you came, but, you were but, kind of inclined not to do it. I didn't really well, no, get Well, no, I was, you know, by that point, I had said, uh, clearly this is something I haven't done before. And one of the things to do at this stage is what you haven't done before. Yes. As much as I've been part of what they call sci-fi movies, I always approach them as kind of fairy tales. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think about the sci-fi stuff. And I wasn't really responsible. The internal logic of the sci-fi was never appealing to you. Not really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you convinced me that there was a human uh, story here that was as important as any of the other elements. And it was that opportunity and the opportunity to work with somebody who, who appeared to be intelligent and collaborative and uh, uh, insightful about the opportunity, the, the telling of this story. That's and me? Then, and then they, me? And then <laughs> and they then said, also would you like to meet John Favreau? <laughs> Do you mind if I ask you about your beaver? My de Havilland beaver? Yes. My flying machine? Yes, one of many. Yes. Tell me about it. It's the one with the big wheels? It's got big wheels and it's a short takeoff and landing. Now, why would you take the Beaver as opposed to, let's say, the uh, uh, Cessna or the helicopter? Well, because there were uh, little uh, dirt strips and uh, and uh, little tiny landing strips all over that area. Is where, there where we were? 
And how would how would you know where to go? Did you had you been there before or maps? Other people they say, and you maps. see a little strip and you just yeah, land. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I rode with you in the in the helicopter, you which did. was a bit of a treat. Well, it was a treat for me. It was a treat for you because I don't often scare directors. <laughs> <laughs> was that good? Did I? Did you? I Your actually, life was was in my hands. It was. Yeah. yeah. They were. They're yeah. very concerned in about that. In a more that. than metaphoric way. It's true. Yeah. And I was helpful. I kept the I kept the helicopter aloft with by keeping my asshole tense the whole trip. It's nice you say so. I'm sure I, they, I they, held it up. It's, great, they love this shit. Great communicate. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, the Kegels helped. The, My Kegels training yeah. helped me. And here's the one I like. Don't worry about the alarm. It just means we're less than 50 feet off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's all that that means. Yeah, yeah I want to explain to my passengers what the noises are. Yeah, don't be scared yeah. by the alarm sound yeah. that says that we're too close to the ground. Yeah. I, I, the thing I couldn't get over was that there was, there's no co-pilot in the in the helicopter, it's just you. Yeah. And I, I was trying to ask you, well, what happens? And you said, if I die, you die. Well, that was, I, I, that was the simple me. explanation. <laughs> I could have, I could have teased it out a bit, yeah, like you right. might do as a director. Yes, but I that's thought, right. but I noticed uh, on on several trips you started to get a little bit bolder. And you started doing the riverbed stuff. And no, was that... it depended on on who was aboard. It the first time I you didn't do that. Bolder. Well, because I wanted you to have well, that's a, a comfortable experience. Then Just on after the, the first time, shitting my pants. <laughs> and the second time, I really didn't give a shit. <laughs> Is your impression of the film different or, or similar from what you had anticipated based on us filming it? I was not surprised at all. I wasn't surprised by anything that I saw because I, I had a pretty clear understanding from the discussions that we had and from uh, the clarity of your control of the tone and the and the piece, I knew what it was going to be. And so it was the same. I, I saw pretty much what I had expected. I'm so glad that we shot it in the yeah. old-fashioned 2D yeah. anamorphic uh, way. You know, we did tests. We did two days of 3D tests because, I, I you know, if we were going to shoot 3D, I want to shoot it in 3D, not convert. You know, that was I felt pretty strongly about that. And what's amazing about it, and, I, and I like, I'm a fan of 3D, I like it when it's done well, but again, it's not for everything. When we shot our explosions, like in the town attack, and we did a test on that, what's interesting is it actually pulls the action further away from you. And with 2D, you don't know how far something is. And so those explosions stack right in your face. And, and also with those lights coming in, when, you, when you're in 3D, you know if it's 50 feet away or 200 feet away or a mile away. When it's 2D, you don't know if those lights are close and moving slowly or they're far away moving fast. And, and I think all that ambiguity helps tell the story in the minds of the audience members as much as it does, you know, as much well, as what you're describing. It's on the because you're dealing in human scale. The whole mistake uh, that, that can be made with uh, the power of the computer and, and CGI is to take things out of human scale. Mm -hmm. And because you can make a force of 2,000 cow-sized ants instead of, you know, one very dangerous ant, you end up with mm -hmm. these things that, that the human mind looks at and says, oh, that's fascinating, but I have no experience. But, but I don't relate yeah. to that yeah. emotionally. Yeah. And that's what happens. And that never happily, I don't think, has happened in our movie. No, it didn't. And we, we really efforted to keep the action in the Western language, too, which was very difficult. And how do we keep it, you know, about the things, the tools that they would use in a Western and not just com completely jump off into another genre so that it felt like parts of a whole. And so I think that scale is there. And so when you see the, the, the violence seems more brutal, even though it's smaller, it's very intimate. It felt as though for an audience seeing it for the first time, it felt a lot more like it would be uh, to experience it rather than to witness it. Those are good horses. Your horse was, that was some animal. I had a good horse. Did you buy your I horse? I bought my horse, and, and I bought also, Daniel's horse You bought also. Daniel's horse, yeah. too. I know Daniel was talking about buying his horse, and I, I was the one who told him that you bought it. He was like, yeah, figures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you rode hard. I was impressed. It was like, well, let's, I remember we even figured out something. I was like, let's really get Harris. Let's see, let's let Harrison open up, because you're always with a pack of people. And it was, you were always holding up a lot, because there were a lot of people, and others not as experienced with you. Sam Rockwell, for one, was not, we didn't hire him for his riding ability. No. He, see, he made the mistake if he tried to learn how to ride himself in the Bronx the, at the very place. Well, that's a good place, place to learn Well, to when ride. you're from yeah. the city, where the hell are you yeah. going to go? The Bronx yeah. is like the country. Right. So he, he went there, and then the horse got spooked from a horn or a bus or something because you're riding along Pelham Parkway, and he took off on him. 
So we got him, and he was very shaken up, and he was scared of horses. Yeah. So we had to get them that big horse, Fred, that was like a Clydesdale or something. We got him from Budweiser commercial, I think. <laughs> like blind in one eye. We were hoping he'd make it through the whole shoot. Right. And he rode on him. But that was a lot. When you were taken off, that group would spread out. So I remember we had you, we, we opened you up once, and, and you rode. It was, it was, it's pretty fun watching you ride because you clearly enjoy it and you're good at it. The first scene we did riding yeah. with some, some serious riding was at night. That's right. Because you're showing up to the town with the torches. Right. And there's gopher holes. And yes. then you introduce another element, which is really uh, anathema to horses, and that's fire. But it was in the Let's storyboards. Light torches. And, and See, and, this is the way you make movies. Everybody's Harris, got a torch. Something to you. If they draw a picture of a torch in the storyboards, you have to do it. I understand. Didn't George Lucas teach but you that? But the guy then they decide to light the torches with a propane torch, which goes... <sighs> So it sounds, which they don't and like which, that which comes up to the horse. And so there's fire and there's a sound. And yes. then there, no. But you used it. What I said was, <laughs> I got to be first. Uh -huh. I'm leading this pack. Mm -hmm. First time we did it, I rode up and, and stopped on my mark. And I looked over and there's an empty horse next yes. to me. Because <laughs> this yes. stunt guy had come off. Uh, off no, his and horse I was watching. I was with yeah. Terry Leonard. Now, yeah. Terry Leonard was our second unit guy done westerns his whole life. Actually, you know him because he worked, doubled. I did four or five movies with him. And he doubled you for the, the big stunt Part under the, the truck. Yeah, under the stagecoach or under the Nazi truck thing. Yes, yeah. and, and I was standing next to him. Now this guy, you know, he's, he's, he's seen quite a bit. And I remember one of his guys fell off the horse yeah. while you guys were riding at the town. And I turned to him and I said, should I yell cut? And he goes, no, I think the shot's still good. <laughs> So you, you enjoy being collaborative. There are certain films that you've you've collaborated on with with filmmakers. I was, I was uh, interested to hear the lot of the lot of the great moments that um, that you were involved with with films were, were ideas that actually came out of your the collaborative process. Did I did I sit around uh, claiming you say ownership? It that way. Of... You didn't say it that way, but I would get the stories out of you little by little over the course of the thing. Sometimes we would pick your brain about about stories. Like the Ewoks were your idea, right? You that. <laughs> yeah. that was, They're still That was idea. yours. The, yeah, uh, the yeah. voiceover from Blade Runner, that was yours. <laughs> <laughs> Any others we can think of? No, right, no, no. These are not the good ones. Those aren't no, the ones? No, 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 not the good ones. Do you want to talk about Kirsch for a minute? Because we lost him uh, not long ago. And you had said, I remember we were... We he were, was um, the sweetest guy. You were telling me about him before he passed. And you had a lot of great things to say. And a lot of those great moments from, 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 from Empire Strikes Back... Sounded like he was very open. Well, there was one moment in particular, and yeah. and and, and um, you know, it, George Lucas was uh, a powerful producer at the time. Directed the first one, mm -hmm. and Kirshner was now directing the second one. And there was a moment in it when Han Solo was about to be cast into a, a, a object later to be purchased by <laughs> Kurtzman and Horsey. Uh, <laughs> made into frozen into carbonite and finally the princess reveals her great love for him and her line is i love you and george had artfully contrived for han solo to say i love you too right not for you well i thought it was a lost opportunity yes yeah, sure. i mean this character had never behaved so unabashedly emotional and, mm -hmm. and conventional uh before and i thought are we Pissing away this great opportunity for the for the character. You want your badasses to be a badass to yeah. the end. You right, want them right, to right. go down uh, the way they the way they lived. So I I, I said, um, I mean, what's the last thing uh, a woman wants to hear when she says I love you? <laughs> <laughs> she says I love you, and I say, I know. Right. And so we shot. You shot one like that, right? Well, you, we shot it, one, you know, just yeah. for protection, where I spoke the line uh -huh. uh, as written. And George, I think that this is a fair enough to say, he went ape shit. He uh -huh. thought it was horrible, and that it would get a bad laugh. So I was obliged to sit next to him when he uh -huh. tested it for the first screening. There was a laugh, but it was a laugh of recognition, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so. He generously let well, it. Well, that that says a lot too. That that somebody could recognize that and see that. And I think that's honestly that that's the art of what 
I think a good director, or in that case producer, does is stay open because inevitably the scene you love the most, the line you love the most, is the one that's going to ruin the movie, well, and look, you can't I'm be stuck to anything. You were everything. You were a utility player. You did it all. <laughs> no, I wasn't in anything. Is what it amounted. I was in. Yeah. You know, I was doing a lot of carpentry work. I'm yes. happy to have it. When did that stop happening? You took off, and you were the guy like, that came I after. When I started becoming, when I became a carpenter. His Fred Roos, who is uh, yes. George Lucas's producer on uh, American Graffiti, American Graffiti and sure. Star Wars. Yeah. One of the producers uh, asked me if I would help out. Um, uh, Dean Tavalaris, who was uh, Francis Coppola's um, art director. Yeah. Uh, Dean had uh, designed an elaborate uh, entrance uh -huh. to Francis's offices. It had been made in the studio mill, but they didn't have a carpenter to install it. I see. And they asked me to do it. And, th and this is after American Graffiti? Was well after American Graffiti. The last day I was, I was working, last night I was working, I worked late to finish it. And at 8.30 in the morning, George Lucas walked in to begin to cast uh, um, Star Wars. Word had gone out to all of the agents that he wasn't going to work with anybody he'd worked with in, in American Graffiti mm -hmm. because he wanted all new, discover, he sure. wanted to discover new faces and fresh talent. And, and he comes with Richard Dreyfuss. Mm -hmm. What yeah. role? Is there not any role that I can think of him playing that wouldn't be a Saturday Night Live sketch? You? For, he was going to be Tansel? I assume he wasn't going to be Alec Guinness. How different my life would be now. Well, anyway, they, they walk in, and, I, and, and uh, I said hi, and they went in and did their interview. And you gave him that look? That uh-huh. That look that you got, that you give me, uh -huh. when I try to give you direction on the set? Like, really? Wait. Did I ever resist you? No, you no. were great. So you I, did. You busted my balls a lot, but I loved it. And I busted your balls a lot, too. We had a lot of fun on the set. And Daniel busted our balls. We busted his. Yeah. It was a very fun environment. But no anyway. ball left unbusted. That's, yeah. that's, that's my motto. So anyway, anyway, he walks in with Richard Dreyfuss. Anyway, they, they, it, was, uh, it, it, it turned out to be a, a, a bit of serendipity because I wasn't given an interview for it. But later on, Fred Roos asked me if I would read with all of the people who you were, were reading for yes. the parts in Star Wars. And I did. I read with three or four hundred actors. Any winners get away? I don't remember any of this. <laughs> all right. All, so, all, all so you're reading all day, and they say, "Hey, wait a minute." They move the camera over, and they say, "This guy's this guy's pretty good with this stuff." Was that it? You were reading Han as a reader. Yeah. And he's got the call and the offer, and the rest. And that, and after that, that's when things took off. And all we have to do is pay him a buck more an hour than. That's <laughs> right. What he's getting <laughs> to, 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 to hang the Francis, door. Francis. Francis. Yeah. Well, good luck. We'll let you know about this part. Thank you very um, much. <laughs> it was a I pleasure really to meet enjoyed you. meeting you. <laughs> I enjoyed meeting you. And I'd love yes. to come back again. Could you read some of the actors? I'd love to come for, back. Uh, you, we want fresh faces. Ah, uh, is the yeah. problem? <laughs> That's <laughs> a real problem with me. <laughs> you fell off a horse. I did. I had a, that was a bad fall. That was that was the scariest thing I think that I've ever seen on a film set. It was really scary. It was, was scary a pack for me. of you. There was you. All the all the all the real riders, right? You yeah. had all the you had all the Apaches, all the outlaws, yeah. all the and the cast and her, and then and then you, then your horse. Well, I what just, happened was that we'd gotten a little cocky because you know we've been riding for three months at that point, right, or however sure. many weeks, and we were galloping in a big group, and it was rough terrain. And my horse, who was the youngest of the bunch, didn't want to go down, ride through the little right. ravine, jumped it, and right. then landed in a buck. Right. And um, I fell off, but I remember the moment I was falling when I knew I was falling, and I was yeah. just like, oh, shit. And I knew it was going to happen, and I knew that all the people were behind me. That was what was scary. That was the scary thing. And who stopped everyone from trampling me? Um, One of the Walt riders? Walt Goggins. Really? Turned his horse sideways really? to stop everybody oh, from running over me. It was like 40 horses. It was intense. And it was crazy, and then it was like, oh, no, because yeah, I ain't grew up around horses. I don't know from horses, and they're just big and scary to be around. And I knew you were a rider. I mean, yeah. that's the one good thing is that you had a background. And I knew in, how to fall, so I tucked and rolled. Yeah. Which was, we didn't get knocked out. I yeah. remember that. But then they took me to the hospital. Yeah. And I didn't have any bleeding on the brain, and they told me I had the hardest head they'd ever seen. We didn't change any. We didn't change the schedule. Everything was. No, it was fine because it was actually was just fine. those wide riding shots, and you were fine without me. It right, just shows right. how much you actually didn't really need me. <laughs>
<laughs> that Nothing one we did. even changed. That one, that's a good action shot. We worked it into the movie. I was watching, when I saw the movie, I was watching for that moment. And yeah. you can't tell at all. I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's it would have been a lame shot well, to there die was in. Well, there, yeah, any, any, any would have been. I just didn't like want it, because I was the only girl. That's what I think. It's You know when you, you fall anywhere, even on the street or anywhere, and it's your pride that hurts more than anything else? The second I fell, I was like, I don't want to be the only girl. So I was like, don't cry. Don't cry. Really? And of course, I'm just like crying. I can't do anything about it. And I was like, man. It was just, we I were looked all... up, and Harrison looked at me, and he's like, she need a medevac? He just wanted the helicopter in there. He wanted, he wanted to take his helicopter. Trauma was a big one for you. Trauma was a big deal for yeah, me. Yeah. yeah, people didn't really know what it was, but right. they knew that they were going to do something cool with this movie, and they sure. knew that someone was going to be able to play this female lead. But the female lead wasn't written. I mean, when I came right. on Tron, it was like we think she's going to be yes. kind of a femme fatale, and we sort of got rid of that. And yes. I was able to really collaborate with their creative team and make something yes. that I'm still really proud of. Something that um, kind of came from my imagination, and I had. I think had I not had the experience on Tron, I wouldn't have been so confident going into pre-production right. with you guys, right. sharing ideas, right. and feeling comfortable sitting there with you and Harrison Ford and Daniel yes. Craig and Alex and Bob. And no, you weren't shy at all. And by the way, I'm never like, what is it? With right. any actor, even with even with like kids, if yeah. they're like, what's going on? Everything is a, is, a, is an opportunity to explore further what the reality of that moment is. Yeah, and we had I mean we had to struggle with a lot of like philosophical questions about like wh I mean really the questions I was asking you often because of the nature of my character. Yes, were had, you know so, were mind benders. Yeah, and and, and 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 dealt with a lot of different different uh, rules of different genres. Yeah, you but I think if that was, had been my gutsy. first rodeo, I would have been like, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm just not going to say anything. No, no, you step. Well, you were lucky too because you got to work with Jeff Bridges. Who's, yes, you know who they don't come better than him. I yeah. had just worked with him, I guess, right before then. Yeah. On Iron Man. And he's the one who told me to, to feel comfortable sharing ideas with you. He's oh, like, yeah. Just talk to John. Oh, yeah. John's yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Oh, so I, I cool. knew it was. I knew Wait a minute. <laughs> Jeff Bridges said I was cool. That's a big deal. He said the you dude, were cool. The dude. Dude said you were the cool. The dude abided. It seems to me like you've been going to Haiti. Every every few every months. Every three right? months. Wow. Go down to Haiti because we run a secondary school there. Yeah. Which is the only free secondary school in Haiti, and I've been going since before the earthquake. We um, right. sponsored primary. No, you were talking schools. about it when we were shooting. You were talking yeah. about when you you screened Home Alone for them. That was a uh, yeah. A, a we did. We've always screened movies for these kids in our schools, and also for the community in Port-au-Prince. There's right. a. Uh, a slum outside Port-au-Prince called City Soleil, which the UN has called the most dangerous place in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and that was before um, the earthquake. It was before earthquake. the earthquake. Yeah. I was down there about two weeks before the earthquake, and we slung a sheet over a wall and we sc to screen a movie for them with a uh, just a projector on a little truck. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. And we thought we had um, a cartoon, a French cartoon. But when we put in the DVD, we realized it was Home Alone. And I was so humiliated because I was like, they're going to hate Home Alone. This is terrible. And they loved it. And they loved it because it was this portal to another universe. Right, it was the suburbs of Chicago. Yes, yeah, suburbs of like Chicago. The and they don't suburbs. understand what snow is. I mean, they've like right. kind of maybe heard of snow, but they don't really. So it's amazing wow. and beautiful, and everything's covered in white fluff. And then you know. But they know Christmas, yeah. They know Christmas, but it's just not a big deal. They understand, right? And and nothing really changes, you know, weather-wise. There's maybe less yeah. hurricanes in winter, but then um, you know the idea of the the main conflict of the story being Macaulay Culkin is left alone in this mansion right. and he's like eating and having fun most of the movie and they yeah. just loved it because they were like what 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 is that universe is that and then i knew at one point because you know, the sheet fell down off the wall and i saw these two like 15 year old guys run and leap on the wall and put the sheet back up and then back up so that to nobody see would it. admit to you when and everyone was, it was wrapped yeah. and it was amazing to see that then we we built the movie theater after the earthquake there were all these right. refugee camps that sprung up and they wanted a, a community center and so our team built a community center and a movie theater in one. So during the weeks, a community center, and during the weekends, they screen movies. And, and what's great is that a lot of our board members at Artists for Peace and Justice, which is our organization, right. are actors, and they were able to bring their movies down there oh, in French. Great. So we had Maria Bello brought down The Mummy 3, and it was one of the first movies we screened at the theater. And not only are they seeing a movie, which for a lot of these kids is the first time they're ever seeing a movie. But a sequel. <laughs> they're seeing a sequel. They don't understand. No, but they have Where's Maria. The they have Maria in... The, the, the audience, uh -huh. and so they're right. it's under, blowing their mind. It's blowing their mind, right. and we had that on film in yes. this documentary that we made about the whole movie theater. That's um, great. Oh, you did a documentary about it? Yeah, it's called Sun City Picture House, and oh, we premiered great. at Tribeca this year. Oh, good. It's really good. Good. 
but I cannot wait to bring cowboys in French <laughs> down to these kids. I mean, that's gonna blow their minds. Yeah, seriously. Right after we finished um, Cowboys and Aliens, I went and did the change up. And that looks really funny. It is really funny. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's interesting to have two such different movies coming out yes. in the same summer. I think it's good for you because here you are promoting one and then you get to show people the other side of you. And I think when somebody yeah. is still relatively new, although in Hollywood, you know, you're, uh, uh, people, people know you, you know, you're, 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 you're on up. a hot streak now. But in, in, in the rest of, around the world, you want, as you introduce yourself to people as a performer, you don't want to just keep hitting the same thing. I don't think people would know. If you saw these two movies, I don't think you'd know it was me. That's good. Which is cool. Yeah. You look totally right. different. Totally different. But the look of, I think, my look in this movie is my favorite thing I've ever done. Yeah. And I also think, I was thinking about this the other day, someone was asking me about our film, and I think it's the first time that I've played a woman. Really? Yeah. I think I've played a lot of girls. Oh, really? Oh, girls, I, think that, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's the first time I've played a lot of, I mean, the first time I've right. played a woman. Ella's like, she's a woman. I mean, she's like, there's like a, a, a wisdom and a kind of groundedness yeah. to her. And I just, I just, I'm so excited because It's really good. You know I'm what, proud you know, of it. as I'm watching it too, you know what I, I like? And as people see the, the materials and they see uh, you in the trailer is they're like, oh, Olivia looks so beautiful or she's so hot. And we made the choice so early on to say, let's really dress you yeah. in a real way. And and they covered themselves. You were covered yeah, to your right. ankles there's no most skin. of the movie. It was just that one scene that there's everyone likes in the trailer. Well, that's what's cool about it, too, is like you spend the whole movie seeing you one way, and it's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of uh, it has it has the effect you want it to have in the film. Yeah. And then the cutting room was great. Uh, Steven had to show it to Michael Kahn, his, his editor. And uh, the one thing he asked about right off the bat was you, your relationship with Daniel, everything about you. We even put some more stuff in really? of you. Just shots here and there because you hadn't lost any scenes. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, I was amazed. But, um, but we put that in and it's, it's been, just been great. It's a really compelling, interesting character. No, just looking we really were both old. in um, Alex, uh, Alex Kurtzman, uh, got yes. to direct his first film. Welcome he was to people. writer, producer on, on right? Cowboys and Aliens and Welcome to People. I'm a, I'm a one day part. I was like a 10 day. 10 day, I'm out. And I like finally that. get to co-star with John Favreau. Uh, yes, that's right, we weren't in any scenes no. together. But there so I'm we waiting for us to have a movie together. Yeah, well this one kind of is, the aliens are kind of me. Oh. I, I, get to, I didn't get to motion capture them, but I did sometimes act out what they were supposed to do. You didn't so even do a cameo. You didn't I do didn't. a Hitchcock oh, I was. I didn't want to take people out of the movie. Not I could yet. never direct myself. I don't know how people do that. I've done it. It seems it, impossible. It's the, wor it's the worst. How do you do? Do you run around to the monitor and watch playback? You like yell, cut, right in somebody's face when you're in the scene with them, <laughs> like Eugene Levy in SCTV. No, it's the worst because you can't really be a director when you're acting because yeah. you're an how actor. You, and so how are you watching the other person's about this. performance? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> give me a little more. Exactly. Let's go again, let's go again. Let's Keep go going. again. No, 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 more. No, it, more. it's, uh, it's um, when you're directing and acting, it's not the traditional director experience because you're, your head's in the performance, or it's not. And either way, I don't give, I, my best performances are certainly not when I'm directing. I really like, too, the relationship between myself and directors when they can surprise me, you know, and, and manipulate me and make me do things that's, you know, that I don't expect even to, to come out of my own performance. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I enjoy. Is How do they do, like what? Like what? Well, you know, I don't know. I, 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 the dog's head, <laughs> roll! Like that kind of? I just gotta call. No. I just gotta call somebody. So he's in the hospital. I'll tell you right after we get through this take. If people do it to each other. It's awful things people do. It's terrible. So, yeah, you know, if they're nice people and at the, you know, you'll go on that ride with them. But you I'm very trust trusting. Them. You gotta trust. And them. that's why I don't work for just any director. Yeah. I mean, I think that most of the time I turn things down is because I don't feel like I uh, trust Connected the director with my life, which is really so, how I have to feel. But in spite of that. Thank I you for, for you. doing my film. A lot of money. <laughs> was that it? it was a, you always want no. to play a cowboy. <laughs> Movies are interesting to me because it's so often it is a group of people that come together in a way, and if all those things hit right and you have the right story, something transcendent and magical happens. And you can't always control the outcome, but with experience, I think you could start to, you know what ingredients it takes to make the cake rise, but you can't always get it to, to work out exactly right. Yeah, and it's, it's never magical until people tell you it was magical. <laughs> and you look back and you say, well, it didn't seem magical. It seemed like a lot of hard work. It, it is uh, a, a medium that you can't entirely master. And I think the more you do it, it's like anything, you realize that there things do need 
so call it magic, call, call you know, chemistry, something has to happen. But when you're in the middle of it, I know I, yeah, I yeah. always feel, uh, you know, that it's all, it's a sort of a discovery or yeah, something. Yeah, you know, the more out there the concept, you know, the more reason for something to fail mm -hmm. than, than to succeed. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're really out there with sort of a new idea, or at least something doesn't, you can't instantly compare it to something else that was previously very successful. You're always, you know, you know, flashlights poking around the dark, right. trying to figure your way out of this labyrinth of darkness. Even if you're making a movie that's full of light and optimism and, and right. good performances, it's it's always a, a, a briar patch until somebody likes your movie. And, and which films did you feel that the most on? Oh, all of them. All of them? All of them. <laughs> Just about, except the sequels. Except the sequels. <laughs> except the sequels. <laughs> At least the sequels, I knew we had a pretty good chance of opening. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> but except for the sequels. How about Jaws, a giant shark? Uh, that, oh that, that, that was, was a huge, giant mishap of <laughs> production. You know, all the, all the stories are not apocryphal. They're true. You know, it was a complete... Wow. A production meltdown in every department, and it was mm. really the ubris of shooting on the ocean, which was my fault, <laughs> as opposed to shooting in a tank with process, which I didn't want to do. Right. And, uh, and, and, but you don't know until the preview. I didn't know what we had until the audience right. told us what we had done in Dallas, Texas, when we right. first showed yeah. the movie to, to the public, 600 people. Yeah. God. And, and that was the first time. And I, I looked at those 600 people and I thought, they're all nuts. <laughs> they like this thing. They're screaming and, and the popcorn's flying in the air and they're laughing in all the right places. They're crazy. This isn't supposed to work. <laughs> and seriously, it was because it was such a, um, every single day, it was just problems compiled on top of other problems, both personality problems and physical production problems and obviously the shark not working all the time. And, and, and so it, it was a relief only after the preview right. was over. I didn't even feel the relief actually until mm -hmm. a couple of weeks after that. But 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 you don't know. Filmmakers don't really know what they got until the public tells us what we've done. I was on the lot the other day, and it just reminded me that yes. uh, that you you did at Warner's and you did at Universal that thing where you, where a young guy sneaks on the lot and then squats in an office. Did you do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that. I did that too. But how did you do? What did you do? I, that's hard to. You actually got onto the lot and you took over just an office. Leave. Well, the office came much later. I got onto the lot just to you know watch him make movies, and right. uh, and so I just got onto the lot and began walking onto you know stages at Universal television stages. Right. And got to watch. Got to not meet but observe Ward Vaughn when the Wagon Train was a series, and wow. this is way in the '60s. You know, way back in those old days in the '60s. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and basically hung out with the editors and, and got to watch them cut these TV shows together in a couple of days. And it was, it was just a great, it was like college. It was like going to a film school, only it was a practical on-the-lot on experience for me. And then The Office came on my next iteration, the following year, following summer when I was off high school. The following summer, I went back to Universal again because the guard had gotten used to me walking onto the lot. <laughs> and that's the second year is when I found The Office. The empty wow. office and sort of just moved into it. I really just wanted a bathroom. <laughs> it had to do with bathroom breaks. It didn't really have to do with needing an office or having to set up a, casting a, a front yeah. of casting <laughs> sessions. It was really about the, 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 the need for a bathroom from time to time. Sure. <laughs> and that's why I got the office. Mine was more, I was trying to use it to create a front <laughs> where I would call people and I'd say, Hi, my name is Brian Grazer. This is not, I'm at Warner Brothers. This is not associated with studio business and I do not want a job, but I'd like to meet you for the following reasons. And then I sort of used the, I used the office as a base of operation to meet a new person every day. And but you were up front saying, it wasn't like, I could get away from the office for a second, I'll meet you on the lot. <laughs> you said you're not, you know. Well, I had to have a callback number. So yes, I had a callback right. number at uh, 843 which was Warner Brothers. <laughs> I amazing. had two union secretaries they wouldn't fire, and I basically started as a law clerk, and I just turned it into the Brian Grazer business, where I could wow. read manuscripts that were mm -hmm. submitted, and I got into their story, pried into their story mm -hmm. department. And Did you get girlfriends to come in and be your assistant or anything? I had everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part of what was exciting about this was being out in Santa Fe with those animals, with those people, with the, that weather, those elements. It reminds me a lot of, of, of the stories of John Ford when they'd go to Monument Valley. Right. They would live in very, you know, and not unlike the way that the characters that they're depicting live. But, but, but Ron had to do the Oklahoma land rush. <laughs> yeah, that and, and that hadn't been done uh, since Cimarron. And you remember, remember yeah. that movie? 
The, uh, w the when we were shooting that scene, it was uh, you know it was kind of the the, the reason that the, the story evolved was because that I'd been visiting my one of my my great grandparents uh, in in uh, in Kansas, and my great grandmother took out this yellowed newspaper article, mm -hmm. and it was this blurry photograph of all the horses leaving the starting line, and she said, that was your great-grandfather. Really? And my dad later said, that was not him. <laughs> I mean, she's decided it's him, but that was not him. But I, with, I did a little poking around and found out that I had actually three relatives yes. who would have been in that race. Kind of comically, nobody ever got any land, but nobody That's died okay. trying, and they all had these wacky sort of adventures. But the moment we were actually filming it, yeah. we had so many historical... Um, uh, you know, recreators who yes. participated in this thing. We had yes. a whole sort of 700 of them who were camped out, and it was uh -huh. its own wild environment uh -huh. over there. But here they came, and because we had 13 cameras, no vehicles could be around. So we had a helicopter, yeah. and so all these these horses and these people on foot and these wagons just started lining up. And I was there, you know, an hour and a half before sunrise was going to be, set, helping to set the shots mm -hmm. and making sure. And I was on a, on a crane, and I was sitting there watching this thing, and everybody, everything was perfect. And I just felt like this is as close as a human being can be to actually ex having a time travel experience. Because yes. my relatives were standing around in wow. anticipation on a line like this 100 years ago. And so it was, a, it was one of those times when movies really right. offers you a real, a, you know, a utterly unique experience. Yeah, and, and, and those times are seem to be long forgotten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, it's it's very hard today now to muster the troops and do the David Lean epic sure. you know, you know, you know, landscape shots yeah. because you know, you know, today you yes. you know that somehow as, as authentic as the shots look in any of our movies, when you've got a hundred thousand characters running around the screen, whether it's the Lord of the Rings or the sure. the Hobbit movie, right. you just somehow know no longer in the back of your mind that there is something a little bit um, create, c creative about, about the shot. Right. And yet, yet if the story is working really well, you forgive yes. and you actually, you, you actually thank the filmmakers for giving you so much eye candy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you stop, and you sort of stop questioning how they did it, if the story is yeah. working. If the story doesn't work, all you do is <laughs> question the shot. I was always wanting to be a director since I was a little kid. I was in L.A. visiting my second cousins, and I, I, my second cousin had one contact in the movie business, but it wasn't re really the movie business, it was the television business. Mm. And he introduced me to this person who created Hogan's Heroes, about 15 at the time. And this guy said, well, you don't want to talk to me. You want to be a movie maker. Why don't you go next door? You know who's next door? I said, no, who? Jack Ford. I called him Jack Ford. He's Jack Ford's right next door. Huh. I'll, I'll, I'll take you across the hall. He takes me across the hallway and he takes me into the office and Jack Ford's assistant or secretary, as they were called in those days, was sitting there and, and Jack, John Ford wasn't there and so she said I could wait. He was out at lunch back any minute and I sat waiting for John Ford to arrive and talking to her and about 40 minutes later, this this old dude walks into the room <laughs> wearing like a safari jacket patch, and a yeah, patch over an eye, yeah, yeah. chewing on a handkerchief oh with, a, with a, a half you know chewed up and very masticated and wet cigar in his hand. <laughs> I saw all this stuff instantly, wow. you know. And he had kiss marks, but I mean like not not make out marks, but the kind of perfect kiss <laughs> marks, two on his cheek here, two here, a couple on the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks right into his office, and his assistant grabs a box of Kleenex and runs in after him. <laughs> and then she comes out about five minutes later, and she's got the Kleenex. It's all red. Yeah. <laughs> red. And she says, okay, you, you've, you've, got, you've got five minutes, probably one minute right. wow. with him. That's right. it. And I walked into the office, and he was sitting behind his desk with his feet up on the desk. And he sat me down, and he just... Uh, said, so they tell me you want to be a picture maker, is what he called it. Wow. I, I never heard that before, but I never forgot it. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I, I really do. I've made all these little eight millimeter movies. And, and he said, what do you know? He said, what do you know about art? And I, 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 I just was stammering. I wasn't expecting that question. He said, do you see those paintings around the office? I said, yeah. He said, well, get up and walk over to the first painting. He said, tell me what you see in that painting. And I said, well, I see two Indians on horses. He said, no, 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 where's the horizon? Oh, wow. wow. So I said, well, the horizon's, you know, you know way above the, the head of the Indians. He said, fine, walk on to the next one. He said, what do you see in that painting? And stupidly I said, well, there's some cavalry on horses. <laughs> I hadn't learned anything, you know. And he said, no, 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 where's the horizon? 
And I said, well, the horizon is the very, very bottom of the painting. He said, okay, get over here. And I stood in front of his desk. He said, when you're able to distinguish the art of the horizon at the bottom of a frame or at the top of the frame, but not going right through the center of the frame, when you're able to appreciate why it's at the top and why it's at the bottom, mm -hmm. you might make a pretty good picture maker. Mm -hmm. Now get the f out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about how, you know, uh, how it came together. I hear there was a there was a, a lunch that you guys were having mm -hmm. together, uh, right? Where where the idea first came past both of your desks? Yeah, we had a couple lunches on we it did. Over, over the we time. We did. It basically my recollection is, is that that uh, I saw the comic. Somebody brought it in, mm -hmm. and I and the 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 cover sort of said it all. The rider, the guy on the horseback shooting up at the uh, at the flying saucer. saucer. Yeah, and I yeah, thought it was yeah. great. And uh, and I had I had heard that uh, Stephen had had developed it for a while, but you know they tried it and they'd sort of cooled on it and they weren't working on it actively anymore. And I had a point and I and then I got one of the scripts and looked at it and I had a point of view about mm -hmm. about sort of how you could recalibrate the the tone of it and the balance. And um, and we got together and had to talk about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And and you know and you decided that DreamWorks should. Go ahead and, and yeah, because uh, I had given up on the project until Ron sort of re rekindled the idea. He brought a whole bunch of new elements that, that we had not considered the first time we developed a screenplay. And what was the big what was the big shift? You said tonally was it was that where it became more a traditional western and less a yes. comedy? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Because the script that we developed was much more tongue in cheek. Right. It, it, it owed more to Mel Brooks's <laughs> movie Blazing <laughs> Saddles, yeah, I think. Yeah, right. Even though it was, had some really funny, funny writing and funny set pieces, it didn't have much of the traditional Western yeah. about it. And, and Ron said, th th for this blend to work, it's got to be tradition. You're doing something different, you know? Yeah. And like Stephen was saying earlier, it's, it's you know, I, th I think it's great. Stephen obviously felt like it was great. That's why we got involved in the project. So did Brian. But the, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, you are doing something bold and cool and so there's going to be a, a you know some some experimentation it's called and cowboys and aliens it, it, yeah I mean, it's never really been done and yeah. the, and the and like like Stephen was saying you know you're 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 always out on a limb when you take a chance like that but I've always felt and I took inspiration from you and, and from George especially early on when I when I got to the point where I realized I was going to get to make more than one movie mm -hmm. I was going to get to yes. have a career I sort of thought of two things one was I didn't want to do the same kind of movie over and over because I'd been an actor on television series sure. and I knew that was a way to succeed, but I'd done that where, you know, sort of repeating mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. And I loved the medium and so I wanted to explore. But the, th the next thing that I thought was, you know, there's a big element of risk to a lot of the choices that, that, that you were making, but, God, when they work, you can't compare them to anything. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, once, once you jumped into this thing, we were kind of all mute. Right. And, yeah. And the <laughs> very first meeting where you made the visual presentation with your art department, yeah. to all of us, it wasn't much for us to say except no. our eyes popped and our mouths hung open and we didn't say very much. Um, the only thing that I turned to Ron and said, Ron said to me, we, we said, <laughs> why didn't we direct this? <laughs> but we're really happy that you did. Now, how did your relationship start with, with uh, DreamWorks and with Steven? We got uh, the Legend of Zorro, Walter Parks. We we actually came into DreamWorks through Walter Parks. Yes. Right. right. And then and then that happened quickly, and so once that happened quickly, everyone kind of said, "Who are the writers of that? Who wrote so fast?" <laughs> right. Because you guys way, do write fast. But that was the other thing too. Is like we, we were sort of shocked when we started actually working really professionally in the feature world, having been trained in television, that everyone yes. was so surprised yes. by the speed of it. Yeah. You know, you, which for us was just how you. That's you how guys you are great with that. That reminds me of our Spielberg confession. What? We actually met him. Long ago, right after we sold our first feature when we were on Hercules, right. Dick Donner is actually the one who attached and he, he sold it for us, God bless him. And he said, you know, Spielberg and I have been trying to do Goonies 2 forever. Really? You should come in and meet him and pitch it to him. So back then, while we're still on Hercules, we're 24, 25, he takes us in, we pitch him Goonies 2, he buys it in the room, calls Warner Brothers, says, let's do it. Three years later, we've never seen him again. Draft after draft, we're, we're lost right. at sea. We screw Goonies right into the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> right? We go through Alias, we go through big script doctors, da da da. Walter Parks, Zorro is coming out. Spielberg walks down the hall. Walter says, Oh, uh, Zorro, I'm sorry, uh, Spielberg, have you ever met uh, Alex and Bob? And we come in, Boys, have you met him? And we're like, 
No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, years later we found out, we're sitting in a meeting, he still doesn't know this, we're sitting with Steven and he goes, oh, I remember we are trying to do Goonies too and horrible script after <laughs> horrible like, script too bad. would oh, come to awful. our door and we're oh, like, yeah. oh man. You should, man, just, what you a should let us take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> After we finished the island, JJ asked us to come write Mission Impossible 3 with him. Right. And so we were actually on the set of War of the Worlds because uh -huh. Tom was shooting War of the Worlds with Steven. And we're on that set of War of the Worlds Doing writing Mission, mission and, and he, he was like circling around the area where we were all sort of having this discussion. And us and I, Tom and JJ. Yeah, and we were sort of looking at each other like, what's going on? <laughs> and then he came over and he said, you know what you guys should do? Transformers. You, know, and, you might want to do one for the company. <laughs> yeah. Because we were on mission, you know. Right. Which is apparently, yeah. he's like, you might want to do one for the home team again. Right. And he goes, I, I think we, I'd like to talk to you about Transformers. And right? he walked away, and Tom turned to us and said, looks like you guys are doing Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're doing Transformers. Wow. That yeah. That's how I got first hired by him. I was an actor. And I was on, auditioning uh, for Deep, Deep Impact. Impact. Yeah. And he walked that's into right. the room, I was auditioning, he says, what are you reading for? <laughs> and Mimi turns around and says, uh, Gus Partenza. Oh, you'd be good for that. And he left. I was like, I was like <laughs> okay. I was like, all right. <laughs> we'll we'll send in. the paperwork over. Uh, That's the amazing gift of working with him. Yeah, he, just he sort of makes says it like, all happen. It's like, you're, hey, go. You, I just decided. Kind you're of doing fun. it. And he does. And he yeah. does it. Yeah, so you did Transformers. And that was really where you, is that where you broke through when that thing was a hit? That was the biggest... Uh, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that, that sort of became that. There was no arguing with that one. So it was like, okay, these guys are here. Well, I think also nobody, nobody uh, knew you, what to do with it. Were you producers at that time, no. too? No. You were just writers. Just wrote it. But nobody but knew you, what to do with it. It had been development for a long time. Well, that was an interesting tone thing, too, because when you first hear that one, it's like, oh, okay. Oh, totally. Oh, my God, that was our reaction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was exactly our reaction. And you took it very seriously, you know? I mean, at, at least the stakes of the world. Like, people could really get hurt there. And those things look like real, real. And ILM, too, deserve a lot oh of credit God. because yeah. they gave it. And when, when Transformers came out, I was working on Iron Man. Right. And I was like, wow. Because I've always been a CG. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, you prove it, prove it, you know, because right. uh, so much of the time it takes me yeah, out of it. But they solved a lot of problems yeah. with that. And I remember for budget reasons, I had to cut out all the scenes in Iron Man where he changes into Iron Man. It was all... Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be Iron but then Man. Didn't you he, shoot them later? He go, you, yeah. You went back and you got them. That's right? what happened. He was like, he would like, right. uh, he go in the phone booth, pull open the S on right. his shirt, and he'd be flying. <laughs> I gotta get, to, I gotta get there. Right. Oh no, we got a problem. Right. And the next thing you see, he's oh, there. Yeah. Just it, was like, it, it was like Power Rangers. <laughs> it was like, okay, cut to Japan right, with yeah. the other. Cast. When the most exciting part is putting on the suit. Well, that's what I said. I said, yeah. look, this whole movie is called the Transformers. All they do is transform. <laughs> <laughs> Like there, and it made a lot of money. There yeah. might be something to it, and that's like, all right, here's money. <laughs> but we did add all those scenes in his workshop, where ILM designed all of this stuff, and we shot it with a body double grabbing and all the pieces mm -hmm. going on, and it's just, I love watching it's awesome. it, you know. It's and great. so much of the Transformers and Iron Man was looking at all the minutia the details, of yeah. the detail and and how it all deploys. Yeah. Is this your first film as producer? Is no, that's Eagle actually Eye. Eagle Eye, right? Eagle that's Eye right. was the following year, right? Or the following couple of years. So now you're away in the fold with 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 DreamWorks. They're trusting you with a lot of projects. You were you were you were pretty prolific, not just as writers but also as producers. We also the, had the you know the good fortune of the the guy who was running our company, uh, the very first executive that we hired. Um, week one said, "Hey, I wrote a script," and it turned out to be the proposal. That's and right, I remember so that. So we, you know, it was great. And then the movie got made like eight months later. Yes. So we were it was also good. producers on that, and it, it did really well. And so I think we had, we just got very sort of lucky in the yeah. timing. And then, and then TV, you guys have Hawaii Five-0 on mm -hmm. the air now. You got um, Fringe. You got an animated Transformer series. Yeah. Uh, you got Welcome to People, which you're now directing. What was that experience like? I mean, it was amazing. You know, we wrote <clears throat> the script for seven years, which is not, we've never really had that experience. Wasn't of, that long? Yeah. It's, it was a seven-year process of just banging our heads against the wall. And it was a side project that, honestly, yeah. we never really thought was going to happen. Yeah. And then... It was a spec. It's our only sec our second spec, Yeah, it was our second spec. And, honestly, because of Steven, once again... He just said, what, time to... No, I, we finished and finally felt like it was in a place. But, you know, we called Steven and said, you know, I, I think I'm going to make this movie. But you don't, have to, you don't have to make it and you don't even have to like it. We just want to know what you think, you know? Yeah. 
and he called, we gave it to him on a Thursday, and he called on a Saturday morning and said, this is, we're going to make it, get that's ready. That's great. You know? If you could get Favreau to play one day in it, you got your green light. <laughs> and we did. So that's <laughs> how did. I got the green you light, did. thanks to you. Is John yeah. still in the movie? Yeah, every, right. every frame we shot. Get, wow. God. <laughs> Kurtzman and I are huge friends and our family, we're, we're vacationing together in Mexico. We're going for a jog uh -huh. on the beach. Uh -huh. And he, I, I, I'm like, what are you working on? And he says, we're trying to, this, uh -huh. this, we're trying to blow the dust off this thing, Cowboys and Aliens, yes. that, that DreamWorks has. But as soon as you hear about it, you go, okay, so why has it been 10 years? Like, what, yeah. th there's gotta be a very good reason this thing hasn't worked. And it's exactly this thing that you ended up having to confront uh -huh in terms of the selling of the movie, which is you've got a very silly title that yes. is exactly what the movie is. So, you know, yes. rule number one, title the movie exactly what the movie is. Yes. The movie's about Thor, call it Thor. If the yes. movie's about Iron Man, call it Iron Man. Yes. If the movie's about laser blasts in space, call it Star Wars. Don't, like, call, don't call it Zathura. Right. <laughs> Okay. No, well, I know. you said it. No, I learned it. That's part of what I think led me to this, the simplicity of the thing, and there it is, and everybody knows Cowboys and Aliens. They react very strongly to it. Right. The, they either get mad at it, yeah. or they love it, or they cheer for it, or right. they're confused by it, but yes. they, they don't forget it. And in this day and age, it's like that's, there's a value to that. Sure. But the question becomes, what is it going to be? Because right. there's a terrible, terrible version of that film, and there's a great version of the film. And yes. You know, where, where do you go? Yeah. And I think that Bob and Alex and, and Ferguson and Otsby had already um, cracked the, the sort of the, the premise of the movie, recouching it as a little bit of a mystery. Yes. You know, which I thought, which I thought was great. That's my, that's my language. That's your whole you know thing. I mean? Well, for me, I thought it was great because the, the, at best, it's, it's the intersection of the two genres. Right. You don't want to spin off into one genre and wink through the other one. Sure. You don't want to just have them happen to be in cowboy hats. Yes. You know, what are the archetypes and paradigms from both genres that work together? Yes. And that's where you get the mashup. Right. That's where you get the synergy. How is it different when you're doing a, a series where you don't get, you know, that, that seems to me that's what's so appealing about doing a show is you could novelize the whole thing. Right. But by the same token, you're, you're never getting you're never really cresting or able to transform the characters that much because you got to leave them on, on the island. You know, right, it's literally. all middle. I mean, yeah. especially, that's why the British format is so appealing, which is, you know, they do, they don't do open-ended series. It's basically, you know, there were two seasons of The Office. State of Play was eight episodes long. That, mm -hmm. And American television really, the, the, the financial metrics up, up until recently did not allow you to do that because the entire aftermarket revenue stream was based on getting to 100 episodes. Right. So for Lost, we had a really exciting beginning and at, once we started, once the show was successful, we started talking about what the middle and what the end looked like and it felt obvious to us um, when we started laying down that construct that the middle of was gonna be about some of them get off, some of them actually leave the island mm -hmm. and once they get off the island, the hits the fan, they realize they have to return to the island to correct the mistake that they made, and then some live, some die, and that's the end of the story. That's gonna be your beginning, middle, and end. But once the show is successful, the network said to us, you can't ever end it, and therefore you, we couldn't ec even get to the point where some people got off the island. So it was this, the season three finale of the show, which was, we were now 75 episodes in, 75 hours of television in before we, anybody got off the island, mm -hmm. which was, in my opinion, already way too late, but it was better than nothing. But yet, I look at it and say how freeing it must be because you could use all this character work. Sure. Whereas, you know... Uh, which is ultimately, I think, you know, what all great genre is, is that you come up with a big sort of crazy construct, like the Empire is trying to yes. blow up planets with the Death Star, but, but ultimately those just become great action set pieces to yes. push cool character stories down the road. So while the island was always interesting to me as a place to set the show, what was infinitely more interesting to all of us, you know, the producers and the writers and the directors and, the, and certainly the actors were that those things, the polar bears running out of the jungle were just really a cool way to start conversations amongst yes, exactly. people who had sure. very different opinions about what that meant. I remember when, when we cast Harrison, we were talking, because I remember we were banging around all sorts of ideas about people, who's uh -huh. it gonna be, who's it gonna be. Right. We were talking a lot on the phone at that time. Definitely. I think one of the things that I remember is we were, we were trying to find the, 
the interesting angle to the character where you know one of the one of these things about these use these adjectives that we were using to describe dollar hide in, in on the page and in our read and in our sort of were tough yeah. kind of curmudgeonly yeah. um, you know potentially racist and so is there a way to come at all still have all those things but come at it from someone who's more inherently affable in terms of yeah. the audience's relationship with them and also you know their take them off the beaten track a little bit, have them do something kind of interesting. And the thing about Harrison that was, you know, truly inspired is that he kind of played one of the most famous cowboys ever yes. in the history of cinema, except he wasn't a cowboy. Yes. Yes. So that idea of kind of saying like, okay, it's not going to be Han. It's going it, to, it's going to have traces of Han, but it's, and he's only been in one Western before, but he's such a Western hero. Well, they've all been. Yeah. Because when the Western died, they, the cinema took the iconography sure. from the Western and threw it into cop movies and threw it into, um, you know, uh, sci-fi. Die Hard's a Western. Fantasy, sure. Die Hard's a Western. Yeah. Uh, and you, you look at it, it's, it's all still there. It's just that the, I guess when the Western was being made originally, that was, that was your big explosion. So you had dynamite, you had guns, right? That's all you had. You had horses and uh, stagecoaches so it's it's I think it's I think American cinema is defined by the Western more than any other genre and if you think about Star Wars and I know you do all the time but if you think about Star Wars you I'm look thinking about it right now <laughs> <laughs> you, I was waiting for you to get off Westerns you've got me again now, now I'm back and back. but with technology with Star Wars let's say all that opened up so they just grabbed those stories and threw it into a new environment sure The first time that I met Steven, it's bit, he just acts like, you know, this is the most natural meeting in the world for him, and you're just sitting there going like, oh, talking to St Steven Spielberg's telling me a story about Jaws. Like, you know, yeah, he's I, actually I, talking to me. He's looking me in the eye, yeah. and I'm just trying not to freak yes. out right now. It is weird that yeah. you reference films. I found that with Harrison, too, that you end up referencing films they were in, and you don't want them to think you're doing it because they're there. Sure. So you find yourself avoiding referencing things you normally would. Right. You know, it's like, you know, when the Millennium Falcon comes back. Right. And you were in it. Yes. <laughs> you, were, you remember that you, part? You know, you were. Now, with Spielberg, yeah. at least he'll talk about all his stuff. Sure. Harrison, you got to get him to, that's the trick is when, right. when you do get a story out of Harrison, if you get a Blade Runner story, you know, everybody's, you know, you sort of call, like I would call Bob over the monitor. Like, yeah, sure. He's Absolutely. Totally. Or like you, you miss Blade Runner. Yes. No! Because you know it's like, it's exactly. like Haley's Comet. Like that's it's right. not going to come <laughs> at any point. If there's any curse of working with these guys who are basically, you know, en enormously iconic in the formation of us as artists, yeah. it's this Copperfield effect that happens, which is, you know, once someone tells you, you know, well, sort of one of the best kept secrets in magic is that David Copperfield is an identical, has an identical twin. Oh, really? No. But oh, I'm just oh, creating oh, the Copperfield oh, effect for you now. Okay. Which is, so if someone had said if, yes. so, if someone had said that to you, yes. you'd basically never ever be able to to yeah, sure. uh, to observe a David Copperfield piece sure, of magic, sure. and it would never yes, it would stop right. being magic. So when Harrison is like, there's a part of me when he is telling stories about Blade Runner or particularly Star Wars that I I'm interested, but I actually don't want to listen. So this idea of like, so I just want to, I want to pretend like Han Solo, you did not portray him. I want to, I want to believe yeah. that he actually existed. I don't want to know. See, what, I'm, so, I'm opposite you know, to you. Yeah. I love it. I love like the making of Star Wars books. To me, what it does to me is say, it makes me say, wow, it's not, there, there's a way to achieve that. They're, it's just normal people doing normal things. Sure. And they're solving the same problems and they got lucky and they worked hard. Right. And they were very, um, as, as happy as you were with it, they were just as, as surprised and, 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 and happy about it. Sure. Star Trek started around the second, the second season of Lost because JJ basically we did the Lost pilot and when I, we, were, we, were, we had to edit that we had I think around six days to lock picture on the pilot after we got back. And on the fifth day, I came into the editing room and JJ was sitting there with Tom Cruise. Um, and he was like, hey, <laughs> Damon, mission hey Damon, this is Tom. Like, and you're, you have to do that weird thing where you pretend like, oh, nice to meet you, Tom. Like, I don't, you know, you're actually meeting me, but I'm, I believe I am familiar with you, sir. And he's yes. like, Tom is like, this thing is amazing. It's great. Yes. Oh my God, I've never been so excited. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is great. And at that moment, I was like, JJ is so gone <laughs> like i'm never ever going to see this guy again yeah, yeah literally three weeks after the pilot was picked up he, he announced was, he was going to go do mission, mission three. three yeah and so he was and when he finished mission three that was about two years of jj's life like sort of in the overlap in the post on mission three that's when yeah. i got the call 
hey, is there any way to make Star Trek cool? Um, that was. And you, you came know, on to write that with Kurtzman and Orsi? I, I produced it. JJ and I, because I was still doing Lost full yes. time, and I was like, I will not have the time yes. to generate pages on this, but I will yes. produce it with you. And Bob and Alex wrote the script. It's interesting because I met JJ. JJ and I had never met ever um, prior to our first creative meeting about Lost. And at that time, their Bad Robot was just a card that you would see at the end of Alias because mm -hmm. they give producers, a, sure. you know, you get, a, yeah. you get a vanity card. But it wasn't, there, it did not exist. Yes. So it was interesting to see that in the six year lifespan of Lost, for, for that title, you know, that vanity card to basically grow to this yeah. massive building in Santa Monica where there's, yeah. where there's editors and, and, and um, sound mixing rooms and, 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 whole and rooms you're not even allowed to go into. Right, but right, right. but it's, all, it's all built around the brand that is JJ in the yes. same way that when you hear Amblin, you, yes. just, yes. You're, it, it's a, you just connect yes. it to Steven yes. and, or Imagine. You know? yes. So those brands, you know, that's something to definitely aspire to. Yeah. The downside is that um, you can't, you know, you can go, you can, you can start fringe, but then you have to entrust others to basic, you just don't have. But that's a skill though. Yeah. You're forced to learn to delegate, which also means identifying talent and knowing exactly how much responsibility to lay onto other people. And then also know how to be the catcher in the rye if they, if they go astray. Part, a big part of the reason I wanted to do, do this project was because I was getting to work with people like Steven and, and Ron Howard and, you know, you're picking up things subconsciously that, just by observing. Yep. Uh, like Stephen, he's taking this meeting, he's going there, he's prepping this film, he's casting that film, he's working on the script for that, he's developing something else, he's coming into my editing room, and boom, 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 solving all of these log jams with a few, you know, with just a few thoughts, and making time to be completely focused. Right. But I see the way Stephen flows through his life with grace, mm -hmm. you know, with a certain amount of poise, and he's doing well with everything. And, and, I, and I see that and I'm like, wow, that's something, you know, is that something to aspire to? Is that something that's overwhelming? Is that something that I'm even capable of? Here's what I think makes it incredibly rare and I think why the collaboration works so well with you and why Bob and Alex and I and JJ work so well together is that fundamentally, the, I the idea of working collaboration is wonderful, but there can only be one vision. When there's, when there's three or four separate visions and they're at odds with each other, it's hard to know what to do. And I remember on Cowboys, you know, this was one of the things that we were facing as we came in, was basically like, whose vision is this movie? Because this was pre-you. And yeah. so you had the, the, the very definition of 800 pound gorillas with Ron sure. and Steven, and who had a huge appreciation for each other, but had, I had been told at that time, had never been in a meeting at the same, simultaneously to mm -hmm. talk about this thing. So we would go over to DreamWorks and be in yeah. a room with Steven, and we would talk more about, uh, as a huge fan of the Western, yes, but we talked more about the, the sci-fi angle of the movie in terms of what did the aliens look like? What did the aliens want? How were the aliens yes. interacting with the people? And then we'd go, and then Ron was basically shooting um, the sequel to The Da Vinci Code. Uh, Angels and Demons. Angels and Demons. We'd go down to set, and then we'd talk to Ron, and all Ron, Ron was like, you, uh, uh, as you, uh, we didn't even want to acknowledge that there were aliens in the movie. It yes, was all yes, like, yes. these are the Western elements and all that. And it was like, so great. we've just got to get these, we've got to get the chocolate and the peanut butter at yes, the same room together yes, because yes. until you came in, it was really getting them narrowed. And we went down yeah. to the Tintin set. We watched Steven basically d directing Tintin and then we had all had right. lunch together. And, sure. and finally, Steven and Ron started talking to each yes, other. Yes. And that was the moment where like, we can now write the draft. Yes. There is... There is vision. And then when you came in, sure. you got to be like, what does this guy want? Let me write for him. Here's what was also cool about this arrangement for me. With this particular group of people, everybody's had a turn. Yep. Everybody knows what it's like to be the captain. And everybody, I find those people are best at saying, how can I best be of service here? Sure. Because it's not, it, it's not as You've much, oddly, it's not as much of an ego thing. I felt that there was a lot of, um, what could we do? We want to hear what you have to say. We need, we want to hear a, a, a point of view that we could all follow and then we'll argue about it. It wasn't like everybody was in lockstep. Sure. But uh, even Steven, when he came into the editing room, was like, hey, here are some ideas. Take whatever you want, don't take whatever you want, but hear me out, uh, which created an incredibly good energy. 